Hi everyone, welcome to lecture 11-2. Don't worry, we're skipping 11-1. That's in a different section. We're not doing it this cycle. So 11-2 is on the foot. Uh, and so we've already studied the osteology of the foot. So you should understand the terminology here in the first slide, as well as all of the different tarsal bones. Uh, and now we'll cover the joints and ligaments of those structures. But first of all, we always like to name our fascias because we're anatomists. Uh, so the fascia here on the bottom of the foot is named the plantar aponeurosis. This is a thickening of the deep investing fascia. And in fact, this is one of the thickest fascias, probably the thickest uh, in the entire body. Um, so, uh, and that makes sense because this area of the body uh, has lots of impacts uh, associated with it from just running, walking, standing, uh, as well as these uh, fascias have to maintain the arch of the foot, which provides a spring mechanism uh, in order to reduce shock uh, that the knees and the hips and the spinal, the vertebral column experience uh, during all of these bipedal movements that we're fortunate enough to make. So plantar aponeurosis on the bottom of the foot uh, and that aponeurosis can carry as much as 14% of the total load on the foot during the walking cycle. So it's critically important, uh, also helps maintain that longitudinal arch. We'll talk about those arches in a little bit more detail in a minute. But if there is a problem with the plantar aponeurosis, as in overuse and tearing of those fibers, it will result in a condition called plantar fasciitis. Uh, which is a terrible uh, burning sensation, inflammation in the bottom of the foot, painful to walk. Uh, and so there are a number of risk factors associated with this other than just the recreational or occupational uh, hazards of walking and carrying heavy loads or doing lots of repetitive activities like uh, running where the foot hits the ground repeatedly uh, for prolonged periods of time. So pay attention to those risk factors like occupational risk factors, high body weight, um, you know, maybe even just poor shoes. An individual doesn't have quality shoes that they walk in. Um, as well as uh, a patient might sometimes have a sudden change in lifestyle. Maybe they just have taken up running. They're doing a couch to 5K and they got ahead of themselves. Uh, they got really into it, really motivated. They saw the videos. They really wanted to go after it and ended up getting plantar fasciitis and having to uh, you know, take, a, take a rest, a break from the routine. So all of those risk factors associated with that. So these arches uh, are critical for that shock absorption and those uh, fascias and tendons associated with these arches also critical in maintaining the arches. So you'll see we have two longitudinal arches, a medial and a lateral longitudinal arch. We also have a transverse arch uh, in the middle of the foot. That transverse arch is uh, formed and facilitated uh, to a large extent by the tendon of tibialis posterioris muscle. So tibialis posterioris comes in on the medial side of the foot, curves down around the bottom, and reattaches on the plantar side of the foot, the sole of the foot, as one might say. <clears throat> so if you develop problems with that plantar or the um, the uh, tibialis posterioris muscle, uh, such as tears or, or whatnot, that can also cause a fallen arch. So we all have a, uh, or, you know, hopefully have a normal arch facilitated by that tibialis posterioris muscle. <clears throat> but in childhood, we all have much more flexible arches. That's why we see toddlers um, first of all, you know, they're learning to walk, so um, that the flexible arch in the toddler from the joints and the ligaments not being solidified in the foot uh, makes it more difficult for toddlers to walk, and that's why they bobble around and toddle so much. Um, but um, as we age, that arch strengthens, the joints and the ligaments uh, solidify, and that these arches become rigid. However, if there's problems with that muscle, you can end up having a fallen arch, also called pes planus or flat-footed. So this, can, um, this flat footed nature means that the shock absorptive nature of these arches and the joints of the foot are less effective 
uh, meaning this can have chain reaction effects up the entire uh, you know, axial skeleton, including the knees and the hip joint, but also the vertebral column and can result in uh, you know, poor posture and pain in all of these uh, joints. So moving on, let's talk about the joints of the ankle. Of course, uh, with any uh, diarthrotic synovial joint, we're going to have collateral ligaments in the ankle. We have a medial uh, collateral ligament, also called the deltoid ligament, and we have a lateral uh, collateral ligament. The lateral collateral ligament here you can see is composed of uh, three different named ligaments. Uh, two of them are a talofibular, an anterior and a posterior, and one the calcaneofibular. So these ligaments are, uh, you know, you don't even have to memorize them. They're just named after the bones to which they attach, the structures they attach to. So super easy there. <clears throat> the joints of the foot, uh, uh, the joints in general, similarly named, named after the bones um, between which they reside. So for instance, there is a, a talocalcaneal joint here in red, also called a sub talar joint. Uh, we have a talonavicular joint between the talus and the navicular bone. Uh, we also have a joint between the cuboid and the calcaneus, calcaneocuboid joint. Uh, so, of course, each of these joints facilitate certain movements. You can see that here. Uh, so, uh, at any rate, uh, part of the whole spring process the, um, the suspension of the body is in these joints. Of course, these joints can be damaged, just like the knee joints, just like, uh, you know, shoulder joints and any other joint. Uh, and these, uh, you can think of these in a very similar way that you think of the knee joint. So the medial collateral ligament is going to be caused by lateral forces, forces coming in from the side of the body, hitting the uh, leg or the ankle, causing uh, a kind of hyper eversion or a forcible eversion of the foot. Uh, with that motion, that strains, stretches the medial collateral ligament and can uh, shear it away or, or cause uh, you know, a, a lesion in that ligament. Uh, sometimes associated with this injury is actually what's called a POTS uh, fracture. POTS fracture being a, uh, a, a slight tearing away, a breaking of the uh, medial malleolus of the tibia. Uh, that medial malleolus at the ankle, instead of the medial collateral ligament tearing, the medial malleolus might actually pull away from the tibia with the ligament and cause a fracture you can see in the image here in the drawing. I should say. So lateral collateral ligament, of course, uh, just the opposite, caused by an inversion of the foot, commonly caused by sudden changes of direction, uh, that sort of thing. Uh, so you can see here uh, this individual stepping forward, deciding to change direction, causing forcible inversion of the foot, uh, pulling that ligament, uh, the lateral ligament, the anterior uh, lateral ligament, between the fibula and the talus, uh, causing it to tear. Uh, so depending on the angle of that inversion, you're going to have a different, um, different ones of the three sub uh, ligaments getting injured. So pay attention to that. <clears throat> so now let's talk about the musculature of the foot. Just like everywhere else, we're dividing this into different compartments. Uh, we have a dorsal compartment. So on the foot, we have a dorsum and a plantar uh, side. So the dorsal side of the foot uh, has the extensors on it, uh, the extensors of the digits and of the toe, the halysis. Uh, then we move on to the plantar side. To make the plantar side make a little bit more sense, dividing it into a superficial plantar compartment and a deep plantar compartment. You can see the muscles uh, in each section uh, listed there. So again, dorsum of the foot, we've got the two uh, dorsal extensors, one for the halysis and one, and then uh, multiple tendons, multiple muscle bellies for the uh, digits. 
These are all innervated by the deep fibular nerve coming through the anterior compartment of the leg down onto the dorsum of the foot. So that makes that too easy. The superficial plantar uh, compartment uh, has just three muscles in it. <clears throat> All but one of those muscles is innervated by the medial plantar nerve. So the three muscle or the two muscles that are more medial are going to be innervated by the medial plantar nerve. Uh, the abductor digiti minimi on the lateral side of the foot all the way over here is innervated by the lateral plantar nerve. So the uh, medial and lateral plantar nerves branch from the tibial nerve coming down the posterior leg, uh, traveling th uh, behind the medial malleolus with Tom, Dick, and a very nervous Harry. So uh, the tibial nerve is the nervous part of that uh, mnemonic. Then we go deep uh, into the deep plantar portion. So this, uh, this region is kind of intermediate. We have quadratus plantae, and we have the, uh, the tendon of flexor digitorum longus. Attached to the tendon of flexor digitorum longus are the lumbricals. So all, uh, the, all of these muscle bellies here are innervated by the lateral plantar nerve, except for the first lumbrical, the most medial uh, of these muscle bellies is innervated by the medial plantar nerve. So notice here, you have the flexor digitorum longus tendons traveling through the plantar side of the foot to flex the digits. So we're talking right now about intrinsic muscle bellies of the foot. Intrinsic muscles, if you haven't uh, caught it yet, intrinsic muscles reside within the body region that they uh, motivate or move. Uh, the extrinsic muscles are muscles that are in a different compartment of the body uh, that have tendons that extend past a joint uh, to move a certain structure. So here we're talking about the foot. The intrinsic muscles of the foot are uh, the ones listed. The extrinsic muscles like the flexor digitorum uh, uh, longus muscle, uh, the tendons there, that would be considered extrinsic to the foot. <clears throat> so going even deeper, now we have removed quadratus plantae, the tendon uh, of uh, flexor digitorum longus, and we are looking deep. We see that this starts to get complicated. So the innervation for most of these, uh, if you'll exclude, uh, excuse my slideshow, the innervation for most of these muscles comes from the lateral plantar nerve and its branches. So at this point, uh, for most of these muscle bellies, that lateral plantar nerve has branched. So it's either the superficial branch or the deep branch of lateral plantar nerve that's innervating it. And we have one muscle uh, belly in this region that is innervated by medial plantar nerve. And of course, that's the most medial of these. And that is the medial head of flexor hallucis brevis, you can see here. So remember, in each of these subcompartments, it's always the most medial one, which is the exception, which ends up getting innervated by medial plantar nerve. So that makes that too easy. And now you can see the color coding for all of these muscle bellies. Now we get into the deepest portion of the foot. We can see the, uh, the interosseous muscles between the uh, metatarsal bones. Uh, so here we have, there are three uh, plantar interosseous uh, muscle bellies that we see in fuchsia. And in the light blue color, we can see four dorsal interosseous uh, muscle bellies. And the dorsal will be deeper than, uh, more in between the uh, metacarp metatarsals than the plantar interossei. And so all of these are fortunately innervated by the deep branch of lateral plantar nerve. So let's take a look at this tibial nerve and how it branches in this more anatomical drawing of the uh, nervous uh, branches here. So remember, tibial nerve uh, travels behind the medial uh, malleolus deep to the flexor retinaculum. That medial nerve, when it's behind the flexor retinaculum, 
will branch into a lateral plantar nerve and a medial plantar nerve. So very easy, named after where they are. They're on the lateral plantar side of the foot. Uh, so then you can see how they travel to innervate the different dermatomes of the foot. So these are going to have the uh, motor and sensory components within them. On the dorsum of the foot, foot the deep fibular nerve travels with the anterior uh, tibial artery in the anterior compartment. At the joint, the, uh, the talar joint of the foot here, the ankle joint, we can see that uh, the anterior tibial artery is going to change its name to dorsalis pedis, or the dorsal artery of the foot. Uh, at that point, the deep fibular nerve continues to travel on the dorsum of the foot to supply those extensor muscles and to supply dorsal sensation. The uh, dorsalis pedis artery uh, has a number of branches to it. Just like the, uh, the arches in the hand, we have a very similar structure in the foot. We have an arch formed by the dorsalis pedis artery called the arcuate artery. It's joined to dorsalis pedis by the lateral tarsal artery. So that forms a kind of triangle anastomosis, those three named arteries. Now, the, uh, the dorsalis pedis artery uh, travels down to pierce between the halysis and uh, the second digit between the first and second digits as the deep plantar artery. So deep plantar artery heading deep into the plantar portion of the foot. So at this point, uh, we'll be able to, so now I'm naming all of these important arteries, highlighting them on the slides. So these are those important arteries. So now let's take a look at the plantar side of the foot. Here is that deep plantar artery. Uh, so it's anastomosing with this plantar arch. The uh, plantar arch is actually the joining of the lateral and medial uh, plantar arteries. So medial and lateral plantar arteries following the same path as the medial and lateral plantar nerves. So at this point, they uh, circle around in the uh, metatarsal region uh, to anastomose with that deep plantar artery, and they're going to give off uh, plantar metatarsal arteries uh, that ultimately form the uh, digital arteries, plantar digital arteries, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So take a look at these highlighted names. So these are all important arteries, fair game. Uh, and now this is, in case you didn't get the three-dimensional structure, this is looking at that uh, in a kind of three-dimensional shaded drawing. So we can see here we're on the medial three-quarters view of the plantar side of the foot with the anterior tibial artery coming down, forming the deep plantar artery and creating that arch with the lateral uh, plantar artery and the medial plantar artery heading behind the uh, first metatarsal there. So here at this point, we get to see a more complete kind of anatomically accurate drawing of the plantar side of the foot uh, with the plantar aponeurosis and the flexor digitorum brevis muscles uh, removed. So here we can see quadratus plantae, and now we can see at this level of dissection, we'd be able to see the uh, medial and lateral plantar arteries and nerves and how they travel through the foot. Uh, once we get below quadratus plantae and the tendon of flexor digitorum longus, we'll be able to see that deep branch of lateral plantar ner nerve heading toward the interosseous muscles there. And then the superficial branch heading out uh, laterally, staying more superficial, as its name implies. Just like in the wrist, you can have an entrapment syndrome with these nerves. So it, deep to the flexor retinaculum, it's analogous to the carpal tunnel. We have the tendons of, uh, of the tibialis posterior, flexor hallucis longus, and the flexor digitorum longus uh, 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 muscle tendons. And those have bursas around them, synovial cushioning joints, uh, not joints, uh, uh, bursas, pockets. Uh, 
within that, between all of those tendons, is going to be that uh, tibial nerve. Tibial nerve with, uh, so with a lot of uh, activity, um, movement of those tendons, that will cause friction, which will cause edema and increased pressure within the flexor retinaculum tunnel of the foot. With that increased pressure comes impingement on the tibial nerve. That tibial nerve, uh, as it gets impinged, uh, the individual will feel uh, pain, burning, leading into numbness and tingling on the plantar side of the foot. So something to pay attention to in especially long distance runners, uh, as well as the uh, plantar fasciitis. So that's all I have for right now. Thanks for watching.